Welcome back to another episode of The Bourbon Lens. This is Jake along with Scott, and today the curtains are drawn, the film is on, and we are here to talk about film land spirits. So we're headed to the wild west of La La Land to learn a lot about whiskey and film in today's podcast. So we are joined by CEO and co-founder of Film Land Spirits, Troy Blotnick. So Troy, thanks for joining The Bourbon Lens today. Oh, absolutely, guys. Thank you for having me. Yeah, super exciting. And and we're recording this. Uh, it will come out a little bit later, but we're recording this the day after Halloween. So pretty cool with uh, the release that we're drinking, Moonlight Mayhem, kind of the parallels with, with all of that and, and diving into it today. So super excited to, to jump in and, and just talk about this. So the question, right, that people are probably like, oh, they're going to talk about bourbon the whole time. We're not because film and spirits, there's some film behind this. So Good icebreaker question, since you all do film, no film, uh, a lot better than Scott and I probably do. Troy, what's your favorite film of all time? My favorite film? Well, it's like people ask me all the time what my favorite bourbon is, mm. right? And I say, well, it's like asking me what my, you know, which of my kids is my favorite, you know? I have one. I'm just not going to tell you what yeah. it is. <laughs> but, but um, you know, it's, it's weird. I always say what my favorite movie is, is like for me, a movie you can watch over and over again. Like if you're flipping channels or whatever, and all of a sudden that movie's on, you don't even have to think twice about it. You just start watching it and you sit there and watch it to the end. That's usually my favorite movie. So it kind of, it kind of rotates. I do have, you know, look, Star Wars, The Freshman, The American President. Those are probably throughout my life, the movies I answered that were my favorite because I'm a sci-fi guy, but I'm also kind of a rom-com guy. Mm. And so, you know, or oh, okay. high concept comedy. So it would probably be those, but really, you know, anything I can just watch over and over again and love and find new things and becomes a favorite. American president. That's with Michael Douglas, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. There, there was another one that there was another president movie that came out some around the same time. My mom watches them both, uh, where like the president like got switched out. Um, I don't know, bad, bad, just guess at what it is, but, uh, um, Dave, yes, Dave. Thank you. Yeah. Great that's movie. It. Yeah. Kevin Klein. Great yeah, movie. Yeah. So, um, but American president is, is, is a great movie. So I'm going to have to go to our, our resident non-film buff. Uh, and that would be Scott on, you know, what is your favorite film? Yeah. If I'm watching a movie, it's, it's probably one of like two movies. It's American psycho is probably my top up. Like what Troy said, I can turn that on and just watch it and I'll get stuck watching it the whole time. Even though I know everything about it, I end up quoting the damn movie. My wife hates me every time I quote the movie. And the other one is Top Gun. And I don't know why that is, but it's just kind of a quirky thing. But yeah, the new one's actually pretty good too. I was kind of surprised. Well, yeah. But, what yeah. was it? 30 years after the original, it comes out and and lives up and, and breaks almost, I think, every record in the in the box office this year. Um, which yeah. Is, which is I think it cool. carried its own. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. So my answer is a little cliche. I like Shawshank Redemption. I can sit down and I will make three hours of time for that every time it's on. Uh, and then if it's on cable, <laughs> it's like twice as long. Um, so right. you're, you're, you're ready for it. Um, but like my guilty pleasure movie that like I can always watch. I like how you, Troy, you said that if it's always on, you're going to stop and watch it. The replacements with Keanu Reeves, football guy. That's your think, football stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, as football movies goes, that one is, is, uh, a one Gene Hackman and, and Keanu. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. Uh, but if we were to rank football movies, I will have to say Rudy is not at the top of the list. Um, vars <laughs> varsity blues is the a one like football movie, um, for me. Uh, and then the water boy, come on. Water boys, <laughs> water boys top five. Top I, five. Okay. I probably have water. Boy ahead. I have water boy ahead of Rudy. How about that? I would do that too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, no offense to all the, the Notre Dame golden domers and Catholics out there. It's just, it's not a movie for me. Um, just, you know, watch it once. And that was, that was over. Uh, but you know, we could probably talk about films all day. I was like one of the original movie pass people. Um, so like when it first came out, I saw 57 movies in one year. Um, like wow. I was, I was on it and my then girlfriend, now wife, she, she like tried to keep up with me cause she wasn't working uh full time. She was a nurse. So she had, you know, three on, uh, and she was like, I can't see half the movies you're watching. And I would just go see crap. Like it didn't matter mm -hmm. what it was. I was like, I'm using this. Um, right. but I fell into the movie moonlight, which ends up winning a lot of Academy awards. Um, 
and like watched it in the middle of the day and didn't have anything going on. Um, and you just learn that there's a lot of things to appreciate about film in general from cinema cinematography to score to CGI, like all those things start to play a role and it's just like building a bourbon, right? So you have all of these people behind the scenes, you, your director, your producers, your, your actors, right? And so you have to build this body of, of a story to, to convey to people. And so I think that's what you all are trying to do with, with these whiskeys is take those parallels, um, which you all know very well as, as a collective, uh, as the libation league as as you all like to call them on your website, uh, and bring that into bourbon. Is, is that kind of the concept that you're, you're bringing those parallels or is this was, Hey, there's a, there's a nice backstory and let's get there. But like, what was the general concept was like to try to find parallels or do something a little bit different? Well, it, you know, we, we say we have a little saying, like we, we make whiskey with a movie making mindset, right? Mm-hmm. What that really, you know, it's glib, but what it really means is, you know, I was, I came out to California 30 years ago um, to be a screenwriter and I was, and I ended up, you know, I didn't go to film school, but I spent the first two, three years out here pretty much doing every job you could possibly imagine in the film business from a production assistant running for ice pops for the director, you know, and getting yelled at for bringing the wrong flavor all the way up to eventually being directing and, and producing and on air promo. I mean, I, I did it all. And um, the thing about film is right. It requires creativity and passion and it's tr- obviously an art, but it's also a science. And when I think about whiskey and making whiskey, it's the same, right? You need creativity, you need passion. And the thing I love about it, is it's an art and it's a science, right? You can give two people the same ingredients and in almost the same situation and circumstances, and you're going to end up with something that tastes a little bit different. And that's what makes it unique. And so the, t- the parallels are there. They're just kind of naturally uh, there for us. Mm. Yeah. And that's really, you know, I think unique, right? Like there's, I always, when I talk to creatives, right? Like I always talk about this passion that they're able to bring. I'm not a creative person. So like, blends are going to be like on the number, like, uh, you know, rounded decimal places and everything. Like, that's just who I am. Like I, I, I'm pretty rigid that way. And I feel like Scott, you know, you're, you've kind of shared that same sentiment with me. Um, and so like to find creatives in this creative space, creating whiskey, it's like that extra oomph, right? Because you have to have, um, you know, that piece of the pie to, to, to garner, you know, uh, building a whiskey in a crowded space, right? Just like a movie, Mm -hmm you can put out all these big box office hits, but it's sometimes the little guy who ends up winning all the awards because they have that right mix of creativity and passion to, to draw out the the story. So let's talk about the story. How did, you know, a a group of filmmakers and group of people in this industry kind of become film land spirits? Uh, Sure. Um, So, you know, I, I've been into bourbon for a long time. I'm a whiskey nerd and, um, one of my really good friends, uh, Charlie, who I've been friends with for almost 30 years, he's one of my partners and the VP of operations for Filmland. He and I kind of got into, he lives in Atlanta, I live in LA, and we kind of got into bourbon sort of separately and together. And we started making these uh, annual pilgrimages to Kentucky. And we'd come and like crazy people go to five or six distilleries a day. And we do that for like four days straight. And we just, we fell in love with it, not just the whiskey, but the culture, and the people, just the art and the science, like I mentioned before. And on one of our trips driving from Louisville to, uh, sorry, from Lexington to Louisville, which we did all the time, I'm looking out the window and the, you know, the hills are going by and the cows are going by. And it just, it just hit me and I turned to him and I'm like, we have to do this. We have to do our own brand. You know, nobody loves this as much as we do. We, we, we live it, we breathe it, we have to do this. And so flash forward a few years and I'm sitting with another friend of mine in Los Angeles who's kind of helping me get this off the ground. And he is, uh, he's also a, he's a podcast host and he's an executive producer on films and a part owner in a film production company. And we're banging our heads against the wall trying to work up our concept. You know, we always knew we wanted to do something a little different. We wanted to do something that was very eye catching and that would give us a creative outlet, but we didn't quite have the concept. And so he started interviewing me. And he asked me what I'm passionate about. And I started talking about writing and the movies and he stopped me and he was like, Troy, the only other thing you talk about this passionately about is whiskey. You've got to find a way to do whiskey and the movies together. 
And like, it, it was seconds after that, just film land came out of us. And then all these ideas started pouring out and then it just snowballed. So, hmm. Oh yeah. And so it, it goes by super quick and it, you know, like I'm sure that moment from that podcast or that interview that you did with him to now mm-hmm. seems like a snap of the fingers. Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, that was uh, nearly two years ago. Actually, it was almost exactly two years ago. So, uh, and and it takes, again, another parallel between movies and, and starting a company or starting a whiskey company. It takes a tremendous amount of effort and work. The details involved are, you, you do, can't even imagine it when you get started and, you know, and then to do it during all the supply chain issues and having to wait a year for our custom bottle and, and things like that. So on the one hand, yes, I can't believe it has gone by in a blink, but on the other hand, you know, it's, it has been a, a lot of work and a long haul to get here. One that I'm very proud of and, and excited to have done. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think what you're saying about, uh, you know, the details, all the details, that's the first thing I noticed about, you know, when, when you guys out, you know, reached out to us about this film land spirits. I was like, oh, okay, let's start Googling and looking it up and check out the website and then see the bottle. And I'm like, okay, there's a lot that goes into this. It's just not, it's just not sourcing whiskey and putting it in a bottle and slapping a name on it from somebody that's 150 years old. You know, it's, it's, it's all encompassing. You know, there's a QR code on here that takes you to the website that has the trailers that has the movie posters and, I just think that's very cool and helps create the story behind what's in the bottle. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, uh, the whole concept here, right. Is that every product we put out is based on an original movie idea that we create one that pays homage to the B movies of the mid 20th century, right? Like big over the top characters, robots and monsters and heroes and villains movies like forbidden planet and Barbarella you know, an attack of the killer tomatoes. So there's a sort of a campy aspect to some of them <laughs> as well. And then we pair that with award-winning ultra premium whiskey. So the, the main part of the label is a movie poster for our original movie idea painted and illustrated in mid 20th century uh, style, retro pulp kind of art, bright eye catching colors. Mm. Yeah. So like explain that, that B movie, like, for, for those people who don't know, understand the film, like, is that just a term for like big movies or like it was it just a, a style of movie that was was happening in the in the mid 20th, 20th century? No, it's, you know, movies get sort of ranked by, you know, the level of stars in them, the level of budget, that kind of thing. So a movies are the movies, you know, Top Gun and the big movies and those kind of things that, you know, go into the theaters. B movies sort of became a thing over time, like. Uh, you know, we, it, it's sort of meant to lower your expectations a little bit. Like if it is in the theater or we're going straight to video, it's going to be a little campy. It's going to be a little over the top. The budget was probably a little more limited. So you should expect like, you know, like, like plan nine from outer space. You don't, you should expect to see maybe some strings hanging the flying saucers and things like that. Right. So it's, you know, and that's maybe even a, a C or a D kind of movie, but it's come to represent like this whole genre of movies and, People setting out to make movies don't always set out to make a B movie. It just kind of ends up in that category because of its flavor or what happened to it or, or, you know, how it came out. Yeah. Like every seventh Steven Seagal movie, um, ends up in that area or John Claude Van Damme. Uh, like, I feel like they just end up, I used to love those. Like you get caught like watching AMC and they would have like these fight movie marathons and you just see mm-hmm. the crappiest movies you've ever seen, but it's a lot of blood, a lot of fun. Um, and then it's all capped off with always with blood sport. It always ends with blood sport. <laughs> but you can't, you can't look away no, because there's just too much to see. Yeah. 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 No. It, it, so that's really interesting to me because as a movie goer, right? Sometimes you just, you focus in on, on that, but there's a whole litany of, of film being created that is not made for the movie theater, right? It's made for right. smaller format. And so, that's, I think what y'all are doing is, is bringing this to a smaller format. Cause you're, you're sourcing good whiskey to put into your product, right? So that, you know, distribution's hard. Like that's another difficult part. So like, if you talk about parallels with movies, like how do you do your distribution? How do you get that out? So like when you're conquering those things, were you kind of saying, Hey, we know like starting off distribution may not be as wide, may not be as, as focused and you got to be really, you know, hit your market so you can, you grow your company organically. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we very purposely started. So we're we're available online, right, mm-hmm. on our website on reservebar.com and some more are coming online soon. So that that you know, from those places, you can ship to forty states now, right? But our our local distribution, where we're available in in stores and restaurants and bars, we specifically started in California, the home of the movies and home entertainment, and in Kentucky, the home of bourbon. And so that was, you know, that was a choice where we know getting started, you know, you're not just going to go into 50 states all of a sudden. You do, like you said, have to build and do it in a very efficient, reasonable way. And so we made that choice to be in these two states to get going. I was going to say, you guys definitely have the advantage on on a shelf because walking down the aisle and this catches your eye. I mean, I, I think you just got to pick up the bottle just to see what it what the hell it is. Right. Right. I mean, I know that was the goal. Custom bottle you know obviously the artwork is is incredibly uh funny yeah and then all the odes to film you know 21 and up you know produced on location in kentucky (laughs) it's just it's just funny like uh, just exploring the bottle learn something new every time those are all very purposeful choices i mean we we every detail in that bottle was thought through you know, 17 different ways and and discussed and figured out what we wanted to be and what effect we wanted to have. And we very much were designing a bottle that we wanted to stand out. And, you know, exactly what you said, Scott, is is have people look at and go, what the heck is that? And grab it and then make it immersive. That's a word we always use has to be immersive. You can just keep going deeper and deeper. I mean, there's Easter eggs on those on those bottles. There's things we'll start to point out on our social media that you can, you know, find and, and hunt for and that kind of thing. So there, there is, there's absolutely a lot in there. And then, you know, like you said before, you can go to a website and read pages of the script. Uh, in a few weeks, there'll be storyboards on there for those script pages. And we have the trailers and we have the movie posters, that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, like just from a transparency perspective and the information that you're providing, it's second to none, right? Like I do feel like I'm getting those credits. Like I do feel like I'm, I'm a part of that production film perspective. Um, like, you know, you scroll down, so we're drinking the moonlight mayhem tonight. And then there's a a cast strength version of this, which is the extended cut, but like, Hey, knowing the mash bill, what's it aged in? Where's it from? What's the proof? And then like, you give some nice, like easy tasting notes for people to, you know, get behind. I think that's just, you know, an added touch because, when, when whiskey is being sourced, it's really difficult because a lot of people just hide behind the veil and they create this, right. this fictional story. But what you all have done is created a story that means something to you all that people can relate to because everyone watches a movie. Right. And, and you know, we, we don't hide the fact that the whiskey is sourced. We're really proud. You know, it's MGP. And we're proud of the fact that it's MGP. And that was a very purposeful choice because we own, we own uh, source barrels from other places as well. Our, our philosophy is a little movie like, right? You go to the best location for a particular shoot, right? Certain movies get shot in Canada. A lot of them get shot now in, in Georgia, near Atlanta, shot in LA, wherever it is. So we're going to be sourcing and are sourcing whiskey from what the best location for that particular uh, whiskey. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, when, when you do that, like a lot of times you're, you're producing in, in many parts, right? So you may get your whiskey from somewhere else, but then you may bottle or, or you may store somewhere else. So are you, are you kind of working with what's best available? So you're getting whiskey from, you know, maybe MGP and then like you're, are you partnering with someone to bottle and, and distribute in Kentucky? Yeah. So we, we actually do the blending ourselves. So there's a group of four of us that come to Kentucky every time we blend and we do have a bottling partner. Uh, there in Kentucky. And we work together to create those blends. And then, you know, then they get bottled in Kentucky. So for us, produced on location in Kentucky means it's blended and bottled in Kentucky. And then on the label, it it does say distilled in Indiana. So does the story emerge out of the whiskey or does the whiskey emerge out of the story? Um, So I, I always say the liquid is the story and the story is the liquid. (laughs) So um, and, and it's because it, it just depends like with, uh, with rise of the robots, which is our, our rye whiskey. Um, I had the title first, right? It just, the title came to my head, rise of the robots. It was actually originally rise of the robot bartenders. And we took off, there was no room on the label. So we took off bartenders <laughs> and, and then the, the story just started, came, you know, came out of me. It's about a future where, uh, technology has been outlawed and a fallen technology Titan builds an army of robotic bartenders to take over the world. And our hero, Courtney, 
uh, is a bartender turned action hero. She has to save the world, right? Big over the top kind of movie. And then, you know, obviously we knew we wanted it to be Rye because it's Rye's R-Y-E-S of the robots. But it just, at that point, we matched the liquid to the story. Mm. And there are other times where we, we, like we have some, you know, unreleased products that'll come in the next couple of years that we found a certain liquid and we wrote a story to match that liquid. Mm. So it, it, it happens either way. It's just part of the yeah. creative process. Very cool. Yeah. So like, you know, paralleling to that, like, you know, sometimes you probably go down to write a script, right. And it just, it's natural, right? Like you mm -hmm. have this concept and you've storyboarded it a little bit and you can write and write and write for days. And then like the other times it's like, you're kind of like throwing spaghetti at a fridge and you're trying to get something to stick. So like from a film perspective as a writer, like how hard is that to, you know, just engage in that concept of sitting down to write a script? Cause you're writing for all these characters and all these people, like, can you talk a little bit about that? Like, I, I know I'm weaving more probably film into this than, than most people would, but like, I'm interested in that since I don't talk to film writers on the day to day. Yeah, no, sure. Um, I, I think it's a little bit different for everybody. And for me, it, it's different depending on, am I writing something that was assigned to me? Am I writing something that is very near and dear to me and as a passion project for me? So it, it, it's a little bit uh, different. I would say um, it's terrifying, mm. right? Starting with a blank screen, blank piece of paper is absolutely terrifying. Yeah. But there's there's a moment, and I know I'm overdoing this whole parallel thing, but like when we blend it, right? Yeah. You're starting, we, we tasted, I think, 50 barrels in, in two days. And it's like, so, oh my gosh, how are we going to narrow this down? But you just kind of get into the process. You start going and momentum builds, right? When you start writing, the ideas start flowing and one idea leads to another. When you're blending, you're like, oh, that barrel has this particular taste we're looking for. And this barrel has the mouthfeel we're looking for. All right, what happens if we combine them? Or let's change the ratio a little bit. Let's say, and it just kind of builds and something unique comes out of it. Mm. So it's, you, you have some components and the components kind of allow you to tell the story, right? Just like, you know, as you go to write, you have kind of a concept and then you're writing to, to the concept of, of what's in front of you. Right. Yeah. You, usually there's, there's a, there's an idea for a movie. I'll, I'll, you know, I would figure out the through line, you know, yeah. when, how do you tell the story of a movie in two sentences, you kind of, you know, start to try and figure out what that is. So at least you have, you know, that goal to sort of write towards. Sometimes I just get an idea for a scene and I'll write that scene and see if that can turn into something else. You know, when I'm writing, when I've written scripts that are like passion for me, I will just start writing. I will just sit down and start writing a scene mm. and you know, the rest of the movie will just come out. And sometimes that scene doesn't even end up in my final script, but it just, you know, it just kind of, you know, just gushes out. It's super impressive. It's hard for me to write three, 500 words. Like you're writing <laughs> thousands. <laughs> like it, because telling a story with like in, in paralleling this to whiskey, like we do some tasting reviews from time to time and like trying to find the right words on a, on a blank nostril, a palette, a finish, right. It can be difficult because you're trying to convey something that is, is personal to you. Right. And this gets into storytelling a lot because as podcasters, we want to tell film one spirit story and like, we want to tell the whiskey story as well. And if we get so bogged down into like trying to find these minute tasting notes, like we try to be authentic with that, but like you have to tell that story. And I think that's what, you know, I wrestle with is like, how do you not go over the top with your story? And mm -hmm. how do you tell it in a way that the average consumer who's going to pick up a bottle maybe for the first time where they have a, they're building their bar. Like we're, tr we don't try to like find these like crazy tasting notes. Like it could be grandma's apple pie to somebody and everyone right. gets what grandma's apple pie is to, to themselves. Right. So I think that's the unique thing that you all are doing here is you're telling that story so people can create the experience with the, with the poor. Yeah. You just, there's certain like in iconic elements, right? Especially it's funny. You said, how do you keep from going over the top? Well, on the movie side of it, right. We're purposely going over the top right now. That's, that's our, our form of B movie is over the top. Like that plot I just told you about rise of the robots. I don't know that I'd sit down and write a movie 
you know, that and trying to like write a really high quality, great movie that's about robotic bartenders taking over the world. I mean, maybe, but I, you know, like B movie titles have a rhythm to them, right? Rise of the robot bartenders, attack of the killer tomatoes, right? There's a rhythm to them and the stories have a rhythm to them too. There's an outrageousness that's allowed that's, that's, that's licensed in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, that, that definitely, definitely makes sense. So like you have these three, um, whiskeys that actually, you know, if, if you go to their website have scored really well, um, they got some silvers at San Francisco, got some golds. Um, you know, so like you're, you're putting out product that, uh, has been, you know, awarded very well. Um, and I know people take awards for whatever they are, but San Francisco is, has some meat, meat behind them, um, yeah. when it, when it comes to competition. So, you know, what's next as you continue to try to tell those stories, right? Like you have three good products in the market, you know, they've been judged and, you know, fairly, uh, what's next as you think about continuing to tell stories? Well, you know, we're, even though we've been at this uh, for two solid years, we're just getting started. We launched on September 15th, right? So, so we're, we're really just beginning. We're, we're working on the distribution side of the story. We're working on getting, you know, building awareness for the brand and for the products and for the stories that we have now. Yeah. I got, I got pages and pages and pages of notes for other concepts and other stories. And we know what some future products are going to be. And we, uh, we definitely going to be playing with uh, sequels and spinoffs and things like that. We've also, you know, tried to add some of the movie vernacular into this. So you mentioned before we have Moonlight Mayhem extended cut, right? Which is the cast strength version of Moonlight Mayhem. So extended cut is a term that re works really well in both whiskey and film, right? In film, it's, it means, you know, you, it's a, maybe it's the director added some extra footage for the video release or, you know, the, there's some deleted scenes, but there's just more to it where our cast strength is more, it's more proof. Uh, in this case. And then we have, you know, when we start doing um, different kinds of barrel finishes, we'll, they'll be labeled remastered, um, things like that. And then when we uh, start putting out single barrels, they'll be called producer's cut. And we've wow. actually trademarked all these terms when they come as they go to uh, whiskey. Smart, right? Because people are trying to tell the story like all the time, like this goes back to storytelling. Um, and I think everyone has probably heard every annoying barrel term <laughs> or whiskey term <laughs> at this point. And, and, uh, I can think of a few people that, you know, kind of rip people to shreds when they, they, they don't, they don't, they just use the same, you know, generic term over and over again. So I, I think it's, it's creative, uh, to do that. Thank you. You know, you mentioned, uh, the medals we got at San Francisco, we submitted those, you know, eight months before we ever hit the market. And we, you know, we thought, okay, you know, maybe we'll pick up a bronze if we're lucky or something like that. And it's funny, I, I, I dreamed most of my youth and, and early adulthood of one day winning an Oscar, right? Winning that kind of gold. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not in the film industry anymore and haven't been for a long time. But then when we won gold medals, Moonlight Mayhem won a gold medal, and Moonlight Mayhem, I'm sorry, uh, Moonlight Mayhem Extended Cut won a gold medal, Rise of the Robots won a gold medal, and Moonlight Mayhem won a silver. That was just awesome. That was an amazing day. We, we were shocked. I definitely shed a couple of tears. I was so excited uh, about it. And it was just, it was like all that hard work, you know, just came together. So, you know, as, as you come off of that, right, like retrospect, right, it's always good to look back at, you know, what you did. So like, I think as, as anyone, I don't think we reflect a lot in the industry. It's always about pushing innovation, what does that mean to you all as a whole, as a group of, of six folks that, you know, to build these products and for the market, like what's it mean to you all to, to have such success so early on? It, it's amazing. It, it is um, gratifying. You know, we've, we've been, I was in Kentucky last week meeting with some folks and going to into some stores and uh, went into one of them and a very, uh, a very well-known store in Louisville very well respected for having, you know, great taste in bourbon and a great selection and went in there just, and they, they already were aware of the product. They'd had it in a restaurant the night before. And I pulled the bottles out to show them and they started tasting and they're digging into the labels and looking at every detail. And they're calling out things that I can remember having four hour discussions about, you know, little things, should that be in, should it have been what color, what size? And it was just, it, it's amazingly gratifying. Um, uh, to, to see that and to experience that after, you know, being just in our little group for so long. But I also know we're just getting started. 
this is the beginning. You know, we, we, we've got a lot of work to do to, to get these products in as many hands and, and, you know, tasted by as many lips as, as possible. And we're really focused on that because we're really proud of it. And we know people are going to, they love the bottles, they love the labels, they love the stories. And I know, you know, they love the whiskey as well. So it's just a matter of getting as many people as possible to be aware of it. So which liquor store was this? Uh, Justin's House of Bourbon. Yeah. It's a good place to be. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's available there now. Yeah. It was, That's it, awesome. It, it was either going to be that or Westport Whiskey and Wine were the two it, that kind of... It, it's available in Westport also. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so I'll tell you, that's another moment that's been really gratifying. If Charlie were here, he'll tell you, because I texted him like practically in the middle of the night. Having spent so much time in Kentucky, like that's what, you know, we went to bourbon school, quote unquote, in Kentucky by spending so much time there. And it's become like a second home. We go we go as consumers to all of those stores. We spent a ton of time in that back room at Westport tasting stuff and, uh, and, and Justin's house of bourbon and, and all these places. And then to wake up one morning and see that we're in there and we're on the shelf. It's just super exciting. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's your, like, we made it like getting your product in Kentucky. It can be difficult. It is trying. Um, you know, we have, a friend in the industry who produces a ton of whiskey, uh, but they've narrowed it down to Nevada and California. They've, even though he wants to put the things in Kentucky, you know, you have to be strategic mm-hmm. about that, right? Like you have to be willing to, to go all out. So like to say, Hey, we want to lay claim in Kentucky with this beautiful representation of a bottle and product. Like that's big because I'm not saying that Kentucky's the end all be all of whiskey consumers. Um, but from a bourbon perspective, they, they sure think we sure think our shit don't stink down here. (laughs) You know, Kentucky's the, the, the like mega center of tourism for bourbon, right? So it's not just the millions of people who live in Kentucky. It's the millions who are coming to visit and being exposed to so many amazing brands of whiskey and bourbon. And now, you know, we're there amongst them and you know, that that's exciting. Yeah, to squeeze out your little portion on, uh, you know, on the shelf to have have space there, and I think the label obviously is going to help it end up in a lot of hands. That you know, aside from the whiskey speaking for itself, but people are just going to pick this up because if they're film buffs or you know whatever, or this reminds them of a movie that they watched in the fifties or something like that, they're going to pick this up and and right. probably buy it. That's exactly what we found. Is a lot of people, you know, what's your target market and all of that, but. As we were developing the brand and we were, you know, we were sharing it with different people to get input, there's appeal, you know, we, we had 25 year old women and men who love this and like, I, we can't wait to have the posters and hang them in our living room. And, you know, we're going to put these bottles on our mantle. This is amazing. And then we had, you know, 75 year old people who remembered watching these kind of movies when they were younger. And it just, you know, and they're, they're all whiskey drinkers and it just sort of has that appeal across, you know, a very wide spectrum. Yeah. No, and I also think we haven't talked about it, but the price point's approachable, right? A lot of times when you have a source product uh, and then you do things like make a, an exquisite bottle and exquisite marketing, like sometimes people are like, mm, that's already triple figures, right? Like it's, we're, we're starting at a hundred. So to be in that under 60 category for your, your two non, um, you know, higher proof products and then, you know, your higher proof product being under, under a hundred even, um, that's super approachable for a lot of people when it comes to drinking whiskey. And so, you know, kudos to you all because you, you've, you've checked a lot of the boxes that a lot of people hate. You checked the box of, we created our own unique story that means something to us. You've put in product, uh, that is at a reasonable price, um, because we know all the taxes and everything that goes into it. It's not cheap. You've created, packaging you've created stories like that people can go and watch like you all have done so much that sometimes the whiskey community's gotten lazy uh and i hate to say it that way but it's just like slap a label on on it and call it sally and it's 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 out but like you all have done that that extra step and so you know kudos to you all for taking those those extra steps thank you i appreciate it and and we you know we obviously uh, have to price it in a way where where we can afford to do this, but we wanted to make it you know approachable. We from the price to the taste, like the the Moonlight Mayhem that we're drinking here, um, we designed it when we were blending very purposely. Like we wanted it to 
be attractive and accessible for new bourbon drinkers, right? To have, to not scare people off, but to have them, you know, have enough, a little bit of sweetness in there and, and none of the burn and just, you know, be able to taste it and go, wow, this is, this is really, this is good. But at the same time, we wanted it to be complex enough that seasoned bourbon drinkers would really enjoy it as well. Right. And then we all, you know, certainly made the cast strength version of it specifically for, you know, seasoned bourbon drinkers and people who like to, you know, have, have a little more kick and something to cut through in a cocktail, that kind of thing. Yeah. This one's like super traditional bourbon for me. Uh, very corn forward, like on the nose, which that's what I like anyways. But then the palate really surprised me because it is way more complex than I expected it to be based upon the nose, which I mean, that's what you're, that's what you're aiming for. I mean, right. Obviously, people are drinking whiskey, not smelling it. But uh, <laughs> when the smell actually kind of takes you in a different direction than what the palate does, I think that's a that's a nice thing. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, it, I would really, you know, really interested to see what what this was at, at a higher proof. Uh, I think the ninety four proof point is super approachable. I think a lot of people just go barrel proof out the gate, um, and that's kind of a hey, we're going to play on what's hot today versus what mm-hmm. you know the majority of people probably drink you know there's a reason why basil hayden continues to put out 80 proof whiskey right right and so i think this is a really approachable proof point um and i think that's what what makes it just it i call this a session bourbon it's a bourbon you can have a uh, quite a few of and, and it's it's okay um if you you know you have too many of the extended cuts you may be having a rough morning the next morning. <laughs> right. Yeah. You right. forget if you forget you're drinking 120 proof whiskey, then uh well the, the thing is too, the, the extended the extended cut, and we'll have to uh we'll have to get you guys some to taste. Um what we keep hearing is people will taste it and be like, there's no heat. It this does not taste like high proof. You're kidding me. This tastes like it's you know upper nineties in there. So it's it's even more dangerous in that respect because you you can drink it, it's really smooth. And, you know, it doesn't feel like you're drinking 115 proof. So the uh, Moonlight Mayhem is at 94 proof. What is the extended cut? Extended cut's at 115. Okay. Which is also still approachable. Like, you're not, like, putting a hazmat label on something and, like, right. telling everyone to get their um, cautionary tale. Avoid of, flames. You know, I, right. I got something. Uh, you know, you got, like, a, something about Chernobyl. Like happening in a movie, like I, I, there, there's, there's something there, or well, I can't, I can't say the other one. That would be, that would be a lot worse. So I'll, I'll, we'll cut that part. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you could, you could do like something like Chernobyl or like a, like a man in like a toxic, you know, a toxic swamp, like swamp thing type thing that could mm-hmm. work for your hazmat. If you, if you wanted to go uh, burn some, if you wanted to find some hundred and forty proof. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I so don't I don't know how people can drink that and still have an esophagus. They don't. They don't. It just goes <laughs> mouth to stomach, and then it's they, all for show. It's all for show. It just burns. <laughs> it burns in their tummy, and then they have to take antacids. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this is super interesting. I uh, like I said at the beginning, I have to go back and watch all these trailers now um, because I keep like in in between Scott talk and you talking, like I keep pushing around on the website. I think the website is is uh is phenomenal and that's keeping me engaged in the story and that's a Thank variety you. of questions have come up because of just kind of looking around and poking around on the website while we've we've been chatting so you know for me i think it's super interesting what you're doing and i love that you're taking whiskey that a lot of people know you're doing your own thing with it and blending it but also you're telling a unique story and, and that's all you know a consumer can ask for yeah, thank you. Thank you. Like everything, the website, you know, very, very detailed planning, put a lot into it and we keep adding to it. You know, like I mentioned, we're adding storyboards in a couple of weeks. Uh, a couple of weeks from now, we're also adding uh, merchandise. So you'll be able to buy Filmland uh, T-shirts, Filmland shirts with the posters on them. You'll be able to buy the posters, tasting glasses, hats, things like that. No, that's pretty awesome. Well, Troy, thank you for for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, everyone, Again, go check out filmandspirits.com before you check out anything else because it, it's great. Um, and I'm sure they have a variety of different things. Be on the lookout for all their updates. And Troy, we really appreciate you joining uh, this episode of the Bourbon Lens. Thank you guys so much. Loved being here. Yeah, really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot. Well, again, thanks everyone for listening to this episode. We really, truly appreciate it. Uh, as always, you can learn more about Bourbon Lens at 
um, Bourbon Lens on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Uh, you can also drop us a line at bourbonlens.com. Um, you know, right, reach out to us right there. Completely redesigned website with all the information on this podcast and others. Uh, and last but not least, huge shout out to our Patreon members. Um, thank you for joining our community. If you're interested, you can join our Patreon community um, for as little as $3 a month. Uh, we'd be glad to have you as we do a variety of different things. Uh, the next big thing is our holiday party. So if you want to join that and hang out with us for some exclusive you know, giveaways, uh, go join our Patreon community today. And until next time, cheers. Cheers. Cheers.